All right, so let's get our uh, kind of papers out and let's see if we can go through a couple <coughs> um, few um, definitions of God. So Roman numeral number one, definition of God, and uh, we're going to look at some alternative views of God that are not found in Scripture uh, to give us something to compare Scripture to. Lewis Sperry Schaefer and his systematic theology said, Theology proper is a scientific investigation into what may be known of the existence, persons, characteristics of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so um, that is a general definition of what we're doing here with theology. Roman numeral number one, the definition of God, and we're going to look um, today, capital letter A, at several, seven, non-Christian worldviews of theology. Everybody's got their idea about who God is or what God is or that God is not. Here are some of these views. On some of the views, we will point out a Bible verse that contradicts that. Um, but um, we're going to start out, number one, with atheism. Atheism. <clears throat> And uh, I'm going to give you a couple uh, divisions underneath, and we'll make a couple notes beside each one. There's the practical atheist. The practical atheist. This is a person who lives as though God does not exist. They live like God does not exist. They might not have really uh, concern one way or the other with the existence of God, but they live like God does not exist. What do we mean by that? What's a person's mindset? that lives like God does not exist. Well, they don't expect judgment for their, for their actions. They determine right and wrong. They practically have become the judge, the God of their own life. And uh, we find this person described in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is uh, uh, a person, a society uh, that has... Um, rejected God. And we find here in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that uh, the things of God, creation, are seen, being understood. Even God's eternal power and Godhead is understood. They're without excuse. But verse 21, it says, because that when they knew God, they did know God, but they don't live like He's their God. They knew Him. They chose not to live. He's a practical atheist. It's as though God does not really exist. There's probably a lot of people like that today that would say, yes, they use the word God as far as what they believe, but their life does not reveal any type of concern for what God thinks about how they're living right that day, where they're at. Atheism. We also have the dogmatic atheist. This is the out front, there is no God. Often uh, those that uh, have a... Uh, have um, um, advanced in uh, uh, to great learning. Uh, the uh, Christopher Hitchens types of this world, Stephen Hawking's, uh, the dogmatic atheists. While they are so smart and they say God does not exist, maybe we should listen to what they say because they're so smart. Um, openly professing their belief against the existence of God. In 1925, a man named Charles Smith founded the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. You thought triple A had a lot of A's in it. That's four A's. American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. Add the word anonymous to the end of it, and it could be like a social disorder, and uh, that's five A's, and, you know, they could meet every week. Hello, I'm Charles Smith, and I don't believe in God. Um, so uh, atheism uh, has always existed, and it, in our day and time, in our culture, it seems like in the last uh, hundred years when um, liberalism came uh, to the forefront, at least in the realm of theology, that it moved even into the realm of um, 
uh, our culture far more than it had uh, in the previous hundred or so years, at least in America. American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. Quick quote, they deliberately pub publish their pleasure in them that to do evil and express the hope that one representative from their camp may undo the work of a score of missionaries and that a few thousand dollars spent in circulation of their infamous literature may offset the millions spent by churches. So they are, they are missionaries to this world as well. Uh, the battle is on. I mean, it's not on if we just kind of stay us four no more in our little cloistered churches and like hunker down in a bunker waiting for the return of the Lord. No, well, then we might not experience really that battle, that strain, but step out in the street and talk about the God, talk about the God of the Bible and talk about the fact that God of the Bible is going to judge mankind because he created them. You'll, you'll, you'll see that there's the, there's the battle. There's the struggles uh, going on right there. Godless societies of Russia, Karl Marx, Lenin, Stalin. We think about those entire societies having God um, uh, attempted to have God taken away from their society. China. It's interesting that some of those countries now are the hungriest, hungriest for God. Um, Nietzsche, have you not heard of the madman who lit a lamp in broad daylight and ran up and down in the marketplace shouting incessantly, I'm looking for God? Because many of the people who were standing there did not believe in God, he aroused a good deal of mirth. Where is God, he shouted, I'll tell you where, we have killed him, you and I. That is... Uh, Example of atheism, dogmatic, and uh, it is there. Just look at, you know, it's, it's just a poll, but look at a poll. These uh, national polling companies will poll Christians, and they'll poll religion um, in this world. And you'll just, just look at the numbers, the number of people that claim atheism, or at least agnosticism, in other words, they, they don't know whether there's a God or not, is is growing every year in, uh, in America. In, in, in Europe, there are some countries where that percentage is extremely high. Okay. Uh, ha have you ever been in a missions conference uh, with someone from, that's a missionary to England? Has anybody ever been in a missions conference where, where someone to the, to the UK is, is t talking about that? What, what do they talk about? Carrie, do I see your hand there? What, what do they talk about? Uh, I'm putting you on the spot. What do they talk about with regard to um, uh, uh, churches in, in England or the UK? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. I'm putting you on the spot. So that's, that's strike one for Mr. Armacost in this uh, class year. So two more and I'm out. Somebody else have to take over. Anybody? Okay, I'll tell you what I saw and then you can tell me if it's what you saw. And this was, this was a few years ago when I was growing up. I saw this. Slides. Click, click. <laughs> click, click. <laughs> the little round. Click, click. Ooh, the bulb went out. Put the new bulb back in. Slides. Click, click. Yeah. Um, can YouTube it and see? Um, here's what I saw. Nice church building. Empty for sale. Click, click. Nice church building for sale. Church building. I will never forget that slideshow. Church building after church building after church building after church building that once probably sat three, four, five hundred people for sale, grass grown up, in decay, unused, and the stat that they said is something to the effect of four percent uh, of people attend church regularly, and that was a long time ago, and that's lots of different types of churches. Um, 
in, in England, who, who <laughs> what did England do not that long ago with regard to the mission, uh, the mission uh, field? They sent the missionaries, and they warned us. They sent the missionaries. Talk to some missionaries today f that are trying to raise support in America. Okay? It's getting more and more difficult. Um, America is, is, is certainly going that way. Um, culture is, uh, is, is certainly going that way. Atheism is growing. Agnosticism is growing. Okay? But, <clears throat> but as uh, Jerry Ross uh, mentioned last uh, semester, when we are getting attacked, what's your best action to take? When the devil's really hitting, what's the best action to take? He'd say he'd go in his office and he would plan a counterattack. So that is not, for some people, that's cause for discouragement. Oh no, let's, let's just try to hold on to what we have. Um, I'm glad when things got dark. I just finished reading Mark through Christmas break and had a great time. But I'm glad when things got dark for the Lord. I'm glad when things got dark in his life the last year, the last week of his life, and betrayals and denials and to where he was simply all alone. I'm glad he did not retreat and come down off the cross, which he could have. He could have come down. Save thyself, come down. Yes, what, what would have happened? He could have saved himself. Maybe he could have somehow lived another 30, 40 years on this earth. I don't know. He could have. Could have. He had the power to come down. But he, he did not come down. By not coming down, here we are. Here we are. So, because um, the battle is... Uh, difficult uh, should not mean that that we can't let that make us cowards okay. because we're trying to be Christ-like and when the battle was the hottest his courage was the strongest right and when the, and when the problems were the hardest God's love and mercy is the most evident <clears throat> So we've got the practical atheist. We've got the dogmatic atheist. Uh, <clears throat> number two, agnosticism, another uh, non-Christian world view of theology. And what does the agnostic do? Well, first off, the word agnostic. We have an A at the beginning, and often an A at the beginning of the word is a negative, kind of like the name Armacost. <laughs> We have an A at the beginning uh, of that word, and so that's a negative. So the word that's left is Gnosticism, G-N-O-S, etc., which is uh, the word for knowledge or to know. So agnosticism uh, really is A, negative, Gnos can't know, don't know. That's the idea of agnosticism. So agnostic accepts nothing beyond the intellectual. There's no absolute knowledge. They're just in the process of trying to seek and find knowledge. Their faith has found no resting place. Uh, go by the University of Chicago in Hyde Park near Pastor Lewis's church, and you'll find quite a few Unitarian Universalist churches, or UCCs, United Church of Christ. Those churches openly proclaim that they come together at different times of the week, sometimes on Sunday, in the quest to search and to seek for knowledge. They are the seekers. We come together from all different backgrounds in life, seeking knowledge. And their church services, so to speak, often are a big circle, with, or a semi-circle, someone in the middle, and everyone sharing their quest for search for knowledge, for absolute truth. That's agnosticism. Um, sometimes churches that get like that, they've actually been um, challenged uh, about whether or not they should be able to maintain their tax-exempt status as a religious institution because you've got to have some statement of faith that, that you rally around in order to be considered a religious institution. They say our statement of faith is that we're seeking for... So th there's some that have had to f really defend themselves about whether they should even be considered a religious institution tax-exempt because there's no statement of faith that they, that they adhere to. 
we're, all, we're still looking for that faith. <laughs> you better find it real quick, otherwise you can start paying taxes. That's what I think the government's ready to say. Better find faith. Where's faith at? Uh, so I don't know who stepped up and said, you know, well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll spill the beans. I really believe in Buddha. Okay, very good. Are you tax exempt. What's the problem here? The problem is this. No matter how hard we try to find the truth through reason of the heart, we cannot hope to find it. Our minds are finite. If men would just finally realize that. Our minds are finite. Limited. God is infinite. Not limited. Our minds are finite. The worship of man's mind and intellect as supreme... Um, is uh, certainly a growing thought. Humanism, all right, in this world. Albert Einstein, to ponder interminably over the reason for one's own existence or the meaning of life in general seems to me, from an objective point of view, to be sheer folly. Okay, so what's the one main problem with that statement that he said? Okay, let me back up. What is, what is one main problem with that? So let me read it again. Listen close. Here's he, him saying this. To ponder interminably over the reason for one's own existence or the meaning of life in general seems to me, from an objective point of view, to be sheer folly. Josh. It's all about what he sees. It's, it's his point of view. It's not faith. Okay. Bethley? Yes, right, together. He's objective. He's the one that determines the objective. So objective, subjective, we know that, right? So here's an issue. Someone that's objective means they're above, they're separated from the issue, and they can see the whole thing. They can see the whole thing in its completeness. Some, someone that's subjective is in, is in the midst of the issue, and so any viewpoint that they have is going to be limited because they can't see the whole picture. They're in here, not up there. So he says, I am objective. My point of view is ob I can see all this life, all the meaning of life from an objective point of view. It's folly. The problem is he's saying that when he's really, like the rest of us, he's just a human. And he needs to get a true objective point of view. Now he's smart, right? Smart enough to... By, you know, end of life to put, what, three letters and one little small number with an equal sign, sort them out in the right place, and he's a genius? Was that E equals MC with two? So that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. He's still subjective. Okay. David Hume the idea that every like cause is the product of our own thinking, it cannot be inferred from the data of our senses. If cause A always seems to produce effect B, we have no justification for saying that A has caused B. It is only habit or custom that makes us think this is so. All that we are entitled to say is that A generally seems to be followed by B. Well, as we just look around, we see what happens, and if we do this and this happens, then, then that's really what truth is. All right, so agnosticism. Any questions about that? Okay, agnosticism. You can't know. You can't know. They actually think, an agnostic thinks that it's, uh, it's um, 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 brash to claim you can know. It actually fills, spills over, if we're not careful, even into the realm when we are saved of our salvation. How can you know you're saved? People want to know, how can you know you're saved? How can you know you're saved? What's our answer to that? How can you know you're saved? What's our simple answer to that? Jordan. We sing the song as kids, right? It's the Bible uses the word know. You may know that you have eternal life. Number three, pantheism. Pantheism. <clears throat> pantheism. This is the idea. 
is that matter originates everything and is God. Matter originates everything and is God. Life and spirit being simply modes of the existence of the all-inclusive absolute. Antheism. The basis of every moral distinction is obliterated by this idea of pantheism. Moral absolutes are being wiped out. Pantheism, all is God. That's one key reason for that. If all nature is God, then human action is not distinct from God, but is the very action of God. So the only thing that's wrong is if what you do offends or is not consented to by someone else. That's the only thing that could be possibly be wrong. The whole category of human crime becomes as worthy as virtue itself. Everything is God. Part of God is everywhere. Pantheism. God is as big as the universe. Pantheism. God is all. All is God. Pantheism. It has its... Um, it has its um, uh, social issues that derive from pantheism. Okay. Things like PETA, not what holds your euros from George's. I don't think that derives from pantheism. I hope not. I hope not. PETA, animals, animal rights. Did you know that chimpanzees sued to try to get... Um, uh, money for something. Did you hear about that one? Anybody hear about that? They tried to get money for this chimpanzee for something. This, the, you can look it up. He lost the case. <laughs> for like his likeness or his, some, some likeness of the chimpanzee. Oh man, what happens though? It's crazy. I was laughing like this, like you guys are about that, 30 years ago when they were talking about homosexual rights. Somebody would say something like that and we, <laughs> we'd be like... <laughs> And we did. Like, oh my, look at that. Those two. We laughed about it. Well, then, then, then the media picks up on it. Then Hollywood sort of puts it in there, and you kind of oh, laugh a little bit about it. Like, they laugh a little less. And, well, I guess I see what they're talking about. And then, then they get vocal. And then, before you know it, a man can marry a man in America within validated and pushed by a president who ran seven years ago that he was against it. Um, environmentalism. Save the planet. Why? Because the planet is looked at as being eternal. If we don't desperately do something to save this planet, which is eternal, pantheistic, then uh, we are going to be guilty of future generations that have to live on this damaged planet that did at our hands. We're destroying. So, uh, <clears throat> um, pantheism, it shows up in uh, social activism in society. Uh, there's generally a religious or belief system behind everything that's happening in this world. There's some belief system. Number four, polytheism. Polytheism, the belief in multiple gods. Belief in multiple gods. Many uh, cultures and societies have uh, done this through the centuries. Egypt was a polytheistic uh, country. And the Lord, one by one, by the ten plagues, attacked the gods of the polytheistic Egyptians and showed them that they... Um, uh, are, were foolish for worshiping the creature, not the creator. Polytheism. <clears throat> Astrology. Mythology. The Greeks. The Romans. Polytheistic. The gods the Romans talked about. The Greeks talked about the gods. Paul on Mars Hill looked all around and saw himself surrounded by um, their, these devotions, these gods, polytheistic. And uh, Paul had to preach monotheism first, and then that God was creator second, 
and then that God as the creator was going to judge his creation. That's Paul's approach on Mars Hill to the polytheistic. All right. So polytheism, belief in multiple gods. Number five, <clears throat> good time to bring up this one, dualism, D-U-A-L-I-S-M, dualism. <clears throat> dualism is best illustrated in uh, the account of Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Anybody to write something down there? Oh, oh well. Try. I'll try to get you. D U A L I S M. Who's Alexander? <laughs> Is that like a Dr. Seuss character? Is he like in the hat, or was he making green eggs? And, mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> anyway, um, dualism. Dualism. This is a two-parted God, impersonal God, part good, part evil, coexisting and related, dualism. This is the yin-yang. This is the Korean flag symbol. That's true. You can look at that. It's a dualistic symbol. Okay. This is Hinduism, Zoroastrianism. Gnosticism. Early Christianity went through the Nestorian controversy. It's dealt with the person of Christ with regard to dualism. Matter and spirit are eternal, coexistent. Dualism. And here's today's version of it that Hollywood so subtly gets through. And what is it? What's today's? What popular uh, film is based completely on this idea of dualism? May the force be with you. The force, the impersonal force of good versus the force of evil. Star Wars um, has a uh, religious um, undertone. That's hardly even an undertone uh, behind it. You should have heard... In 1977, when Star Wars came out, where were you in 1977? I can ask that Dr. Johnson asked that last night. Where were you? I know where I was. I was getting my spankings like a kindergartner. Anyway, um, you should have heard the pastors preach, the evangelists preach about Star Wars because they knew what was being pushed through the means of media and movie and entertainment, which is where the cutting edge for societal change comes through its entertainment. So it happened in Rome, so it's happening today. And like lemmings, we walk along and get our minds and uh, thoughts all messed up with that. The force, the force of good versus the force of evil. There's no God in Star Wars. There's forces. You just want to be on the good side, not the dark side. Star Wars keeps coming out again and again. I think another one just came out again and again and again. They're going to push the same thing. All right. <clears throat> Dualism. A lot of people believe God is nothing more than just the force. A force of evil versus the force of good. Karma, right? That's a famous word now. Karma. All right. <clears throat> the you build up the good or you build up the bad and it comes back to, to get you. Number six. Deism, D-E-I-S-M, deism. And uh, this is the idea of um, <clears throat> that God, God exists, He created, and after His creation, He created things such to where natural effects was, were, would take over from creation onward. He, he is, he is a, a, an aloof God. He is a disconnected God. God from his creation, deism. Natural laws will affect and they'll do what they're going to do. And uh, man's left to himself. He stepped out of the picture. God's purpose was to create a self-sustaining creation. And after that, step back. <clears throat> Some other words that go along with this are called naturalism and also fatalism. Number seven, monotheism. 
monotheism. This is the belief in one supreme solitary God, which we believe in. But there's other religions that are also monotheistic. They just have the wrong God. What's our uh, main religion that might come to your mind right now that is monotheist, but that's got the wrong God, Jordan? Islam. Islam. That's part of their mantra, right? There's one God. And Muhammad is his prophet. Wrong God. Okay. So Islam is monotheistic. Um, but Allah... Uh, is not um, the God of the Bible. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read a couple things and we'll be done here. You don't have to write all these down, but I'll give you some letter B, abstract, false definitions of God. Here's just some things that people have said. Um, you might just listen to these. God is the quality in human society which supports and enriches its spiritual quest. Uh, the feel-good New Age God of maybe Oprah Winfrey. The feel good, let's get our lives together. He's going to enrich our life and let's uh, meet every day and just talk about life and live life better. And God's going to help us in our spiritual journey. Thank you, Oprah. New Age promoter as well. Again, you got her. You have a talk show host who's an open homosexual named Ellen. I remember the time, oh my, on her TV show, did you hear? And it was like, oh no. Wow, she actually said she's a homosexual. Well, now she's everyday popular. It's just com no, no, nobody's batting an eye. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. All right, the frog got put in the water. The water was cool. Somebody's there turning the temperature up, and the frog, a lot of Christians, if we're not careful, are staying in the, in the water while it's heating up. Frog needs to hop out of that water. Or it's too late. God is, number two, totality of relations constituting the whole social order of growing humanity. God is the symbol to designate the universe. God is our conception. God is our conception, born of our experience. What is God to you? Well, I've had a terrible, horrible past. My life. God is unjust. God is unfair. And one uh, famous rock and roll uh, producer said God is the opiate of the people. That, that was picked up from, uh, from communism, the, the early communists, and followed through by uh, the 60s rock and roll movement. There's some things about God uh, as far as false views. We're going to start Friday uh, with God as uh, given in Scripture. All right, we'll let you go. Thank you.